again. My name is Todd Malone. It's a pleasure to be with you here this morning. Happy Mother's Day. Um, I loved all the songs that we sang this morning. Uh, Be Thou My Vision is actually the last song that I sang with my grandfather before he died, before he stepped into the presence of the Lord, and the Lord was his vision in a whole new way. But I also like the first song that we sang. I think it's very appropriate that we sing, King of Heaven, Come Now. Let's think about for a second what we're saying when we say that. I mean, God is here. He's he's everywhere. There's no place. He doesn't need to show up. He is, in fact, here. So what are we saying? We are asking that the Lord would reveal himself in such a way that it is undeniable to all those who look around that he is present. And in a week like we've had this past week here in Longview, that's a good thing to ask for, isn't it? Um, I was made aware this morning that uh, at least Macedonia Baptist does not have power this morning. I think there are some other churches that are struggling as well. Would, let's just stop and pray for our community and pray for these churches. Uh, these are our brothers and sisters in Christ who are seeking to, to minister faithfully, and we need to stand with them in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are, um, we are here because you drew us here this morning, and we thank you for that. We are here because we love you and we trust you, And you are the one that we turn to when things are not as they should be. And Lord, for many this past week, that is exactly um, how it feels. Uh, Our weeks have been interrupted by just a lot of chaos and destruction. And Lord, uh, it has affected people that we care about within this church Lord, it's also affected brothers and sisters in Christ, churches in this community, maybe people that we don't even know, but we will spend eternity with, and they are doing the faithful work of serving you and reaching into their neighborhoods and and the relationships that you have given them. And Lord, we ask that you would comfort them. Lord, we ask that you would help these churches to rebuild quickly, that they would feel the presence and power of you at work in their midst, And that they would uh, look back on these moments and say this was a time when God was uniquely glorified within their community of believers. And Lord, we even ask that here. We have been, as as a church, facilities untouched. But Lord, there are many people in our church who have been affected deeply. And we ask that you would, again, Put them in a place a year from now when they are looking back on this and they were saying, our God has been glorified in an extraordinary way. Lord, may you be honored this morning. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I do suspect that there's a lot on people's minds this morning. Uh, It is Mother's Day or Dove Bar Day, as we call it on the staff. Um, We, of course, have had the storms that have deeply affected many of us. We've had to deal with uh, chaos and destruction. And then for many of you, this is graduation weekend. It occurs to me as I say that, that we have just stepped into a metaphor. Moms start with the joy and celebration of becoming mom. That's followed by roughly 18 years of chaos and destruction. (laughs) And then there's the celebration of graduation. (laughs) Or maybe that was just my mom. One of the words that fits really well when we think about becoming a mom or becoming a graduate is the word anticipation. There's the anticipation leading up to the moment. When will this baby ever get here? When will finals ever be over? Then there's the anticipation that comes after the big moment. What will the new phase of life be like? Am I truly ready for what's next? 
as we're working our way through the first five books of the Old Testament, we're pausing for a second in Exodus chapter 2 in a passage that is very much about anticipation. Now, at first glance, Exodus 2 looks like it's about Moses. How is he born? Why does he flee Egypt? Where does he go? But, but when you look a little more closely, you see that Moses isn't really the main actor in the story at all. The story is about what God is doing and about what God is about to do. The story is more about who God is than it is about who Moses is. It's a story of who God is in the face of catastrophic evil in a faithless world. I want to take a second and just look at the context of Exodus chapter 2 to help us orient ourselves to better understand the nature of the evil that was faced by God's people in chapter 2. Now, in Exodus 1, it tells us three important facts about Israel's situation going into chapter 2. First fact is that the people of Israel were thriving. Joseph and his generation had died out. In fact, the events of Exodus 1 take place 400 years after the close of, of uh, Genesis, after Joseph's death. Verse 7 says that they multiplied, the people, Joseph's descendants multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. So during the 400 years that they had been in Egypt, they had become a powerful presence. If you go back to Genesis 46, you see God telling Joseph's dad, Jacob, it's okay to go to Egypt. Take your family to Egypt because when you go to Egypt, while you're in Egypt, I'm going to build your family into a great nation. And 400 years later, it is clear that God has kept his promise. Verse 8 tells us a second important fact about the context of chapter 2. There arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. If you remember, when we were reading through the last 10 chapters of Genesis, you see Joseph becoming more and more important and also more and more beloved. It says repeatedly throughout his life that God was with him. And because God was with him, he was blessed. And those around him were blessed. And Joseph rises to prominence in Egypt, and he is beloved within Egypt. But now the attitude has changed. Joseph's descendants are now feared. They are a threat. And finally, the new king develops a series of three plans to oppress Israel. First thing he does is he, try to he tries to enslave them and he tries to oppress them through heavy burdens. And when this doesn't work, he goes to plan B. The king tells all the Hebrew midwives to kill the newborn sons as soon as they're born. When this doesn't work, he goes to plan C and Pharaoh says to any of the Egyptians, to all of his people, if you see a newborn baby boy that belongs to the Hebrews, it's one of the Jewish baby boys, kill him. By throwing him into the Nile. Do you see what's happening? If Pharaoh's plan succeeds. Over time. Over the course of a generation or two. That people would be wiped out. This is a plan for genocide. And until then. Until those people are wiped out. Pharaoh is going to crush those people. Both physically and psychologically. That's the context of chapter 2. And chapter 2 opens with the birth of a Jewish baby boy. And the first 10 verses of chapter 2 take us through a series of extraordinary events that preserve this baby's life. And I'm calling these events orchestrated coincidence. Think about everything that has to go right for this baby to survive. He has, to be, uh, he has to avoid being killed in the first three months by any Egyptian that might wander past his home and hear a baby cry. By any Egyptian that might get word from someone else that a baby has been born. By any Egyptian that wants to just poke around and look for a Hebrew baby to throw into the Nile in order to honor his king's command. 
So that's the first thing that has to go right, is this baby has to survive for the first three months. Next, this whole basket plan has got to work. It's got to be watertight. It's got to float. It's very important, if you think about it, that this basket stay close to the shore. Why? What are the two things that would happen if it wandered out into the middle of the Nile? Number one thing that you have to worry about, and this was a big deal that they worried about a lot, were crocodiles. Number two, let's assume that crocodiles ignored the basket. Where is that basket going to go? To the Mediterranean Sea. It's important that this basket stay by the shore. Next, the basket needs to be found, but it needs to be found by the right person. And guess who finds it? The daughter of the person who ordered the baby's death. And it's not like the daughter didn't know what was going on. She recognized this is a Hebrew baby boy. But she responded compassionately. She disobeyed her father. And she allowed the baby to live. And next, Pharaoh's daughter even paid for Moses' mother to care for him. I think most mothers, the best compensation they think they're going to get will be dove bars. Um, Moses' mother got something else. And why does this happen? This happens because the baby was found while Moses' sister was there, and Moses' sister had the courage to speak up. And don't miss the importance of the fact that it's Moses' mother who is his nurse. What we know is that it would have been at least three years that Moses would have stayed in the home of his mother and, would have, and she would have cared for him. It's also very likely that even after she handed the baby back over to Pharaoh's daughter, a nurse would have an ongoing role in the life of raising a child. So it's very possible that Moses' mother had an ongoing role in Moses' life as he grew. Why is this important? It's not just an interesting, oh, that's cool how that worked out. Who teaches Moses who his people are? Who teaches Moses who his God is? It almost certainly had to have been his mother during however long it was that she watched over him. Can I just pause here for a second for a commercial? For those of you who weren't in here, we are doing something that's kind of being driven through children's ministry, but it affects the entire church. That it's called Faith at Home. And what they're launching this morning, as Rebecca mentioned during announcements, is the Faith Path. And what that is, is an intentional plan for how you start at the earliest days, honestly, even before the child is born, and how you help train that child to know who God is and how to live in relationship with him. And it's, it takes you through how do you share your faith with a child? How do you help your, help your child understand the character of God and the nature of God and how that works with us as that child moves into teenage years and beyond? So it doesn't matter if your child is eight weeks old or 18 years old. This is something for you to participate in, and I would strongly encourage you to stop by the desk afterwards and pick up information about the faith path. Faith path. It's an amazing resource. Finally, despite being a Hebrew boy, Moses is raised in Pharaoh's daughter's home. Moses was trained to be an aristocrat and leader in arguably the most powerful empire on the planet at the time. And you wonder where it is that Moses learned to lead a nation. He was raised and trained under the greatest leaders of his day. And we can look at these events in two ways. We can see them as coincidences. It was coincidence that Moses survived the first three months, was found by a compassionate member of Pharaoh's family, was raised by his own mother, and then educated by their cultural elite. We can say that was all just coincidence. Or we can look at it another way. We can say that there was someone who was orchestrating those coincidences. 
there is someone who's carrying out a plan, step by step, that will culminate in the freeing and the establishing of God's people. Which means they weren't really coincidences at all. He was orchestrating a plan. And that seems to be what makes the most sense. See, we look at these 10 verses, and it just jumps out at us. It's just obvious to us. God is at work in every detail. He is, ex- he is orchestrating something incredible in the midst of horrible evil. <clears throat> but ironically, we see it here, but we miss it in our own lives. Right, we have two groups of people who are sitting here this morning. We have one group of people who are sitting here that they are thanking the Lord that their home was not damaged by the storm. And we have another group of people that is sitting here wondering what is worth salvaging and what they need to get rid of. They're wondering how to pay for the damage. They're wondering how long it will be until their life is restored to normalcy. And I'd like to very gently and tenderly suggest that both groups need to answer the same questions. How is God at work here? How is God at work in your life? Whether or not your house was spared, you've got to ask, what is God showing you about how tightly you cling to what is temporary? You have to ask the question, how is God deepening your heart with compassion to those who were so badly devastated by this? You have to ask how the power of God's creation pictures God's extraordinary majesty. And you have to ask how the destructive power of creation shows the impact of being in a sinful and fallen world. God is at work in every detail. And that includes the details of the extraordinary moments, like protecting a baby in a basket. And it's equally true in the tedious moments of life, like, say, 40 years hiding in a desert. And that's where Moses ends up in verses 11 through 22. It's the consequence of a rash and sinful act, but it's something that God uses to mature him and prepare him for his future. Acts 7 tells us that Moses was 40 years old when we find him in verse 11. Verse 11 says that he looked on his people's burdens. It's not just that Moses saw what was going on. That's the wrong way to understand the word look. The word look here in the Hebrew means to see with deep emotion. Moses, like God, and we'll see the same word applied to God in a few verses, sees what is happening, and he is deeply, deeply distressed. And his response to the distress, according to verse 12, was to do something he knew was wrong. How do we know that he knew was wrong? Because he did What we all do when we're going to do something that's wrong. We look around and say, am I about to get away with this? And he decided, why, yes, I am going to get away with this. And so he responds to his distress by committing murder. And then he tries to cover it up. You know what stands out to me about verses 13 and 14? It's not just that his cover-up failed. It's how his own people react to him. These are the people that he wanted to care for, that he wanted to deliver. But when the man says to him, who made you a prince and judge over us? What he's really saying is, who are you to bring justice to us and for us? Moses' motive might have been good, but his method was sinful. And it alienated him from the very people that he wanted to help. Moses wanted justice for his people. He wanted to ease their burden, and that was a good thing. But he used an ungodly and sinful method. And that undermined everything that he wanted to accomplish. The consequences of that rash and sinful decision are in verses 14 and 15. Moses flees Egypt because Pharaoh wants to kill him. 
Now, there's lots of speculation about where the land of Midian is. Um, and you'll hear different people tell you where the land of Midian was, but we don't actually know where the land of Midian was. So as you read that, just maybe they're right, maybe they're not, but we don't know where it is. But here's what we do know. We know that it's outside of Egypt and it's outside of the Pharaoh's reach, right? That's why he goes there. But what does that mean for Moses? That means he is outside of the ability to reach back in and help the people that he wanted to deliver. The consequences of Moses' action was that he was taken out of the game. He could no longer intervene to ease the burden of his people. But we see almost immediately that there's something different about Moses Things are beginning to change with Moses as he, as he enters Midian. He again steps into the role of a deliverer, but his methods are very different this time. It seems that he has restraint with the shepherds. He takes the extra step of showing compassion towards the women. His methods are consistent with God's character. And one of the reasons I'm absolutely convinced of this is the completely different result. In Egypt... When he wanted to help the people, the people responded with, who are you? Stay away. In Midian, his efforts led to the question, who are you? Come join us. By the time we get to the end of this section, Moses is content. It's an interesting word that's used there. It means that there is a sense of pleasure. A, a, a settled in to being in Midian. But that's not that's all that's going inside of Moses emotionally. Verse 22 clues us in that something else is happening as well. The name Gershom is, is a combination of words that means both alien and there. The words sound like the Hebrew word for foreigner. So although Moses is, con is content, he still recognized that this is not where he is ultimately settled. He is still an alien here. He is a foreigner here. He still has a heart for his people. As we move through Exodus 2, Moses continues his role as a deliverer, but he changes his method. Moses is content with where God has him, even as he still has a heart for his people. The consequences of Moses' first rash, sinful attempt to be a deliverer was that he was taken away from the people that he wanted to deliver. But God used that time. Acts 7, again, tells us that Moses was in Midian for another 40 years. That's a long time to be in a desert. It's a long time to be away from the people that he wanted to deliver. But sometimes that is exactly where God puts us. One of the most constant patterns in scripture is that God puts his people in positions where they must wait. David was crowned king. What did he do right after that? He went back to tending sheep. We saw in Genesis, Abram was promised a land and a people. But did you notice the only part of the land that he ever personally owned was a gravesite? Joseph spent years as a slave and as a prisoner. God tends to make people wait. But it is in the waiting that God prepares them for what is next. And that's exactly what you see with Moses. And it's exactly what he does with us. There is a um, husband and wife here at FBC. It's actually, I know more than one family that's in this situation. But this particular husband and wife desperately want to be parents. And when it seemed like that wasn't going to happen biologically, they pursued the, adoption, the option of adoption. But unfortunately, there was a roadblock in their way that they really had nothing to do with, and therefore they had nothing to, they had no way to fix it. And adoption was not going to be an option for them. So now they're going to try a few more things. 
And they are waiting in the desert with no guarantees of how this is going to play out. But here's what's remarkable, is their response is just like Moses at the end of this chapter. They are content and they are unsettled. They are unsettled because they want a child, and that is a good and righteous desire. And if God gives them a child, there are going to be waves of tears of joy. But they are also content. They know that this is the situation in which God has placed them. They will be content that this is where God wants them. And if it becomes obvious that they will not have a child, there are going to be waves of tears of pain and disappointment, and that is appropriate. But they will move forward and trust that God is with them, even in the desert. That is what it means to be content, even when we are unsettled. This young couple, quite frankly, is one of my heroes of the faith. I want to be more like Jesus by being more like them. And the fact is, I fear that I can be the sort of person who can be so discontent with what I do not have that I can fail to be content with what God has given me and where he has put me. And I pray, Lord, help me to be content with your goodness and your gracious and your generosity in my life. Help me be discontent with the evil and unrighteousness in the world. Help me be discontent with what makes you discontent. That is my prayer. Exodus 2 actually closes with what makes God discontent. And we see that in the remembered covenant. God uses four things in this short paragraph. He does four things in this short paragraph. The first is he heard their groanings. Let me let you in on a secret. When my mother, with raised voice, said, Todd, did you hear me? She was not asking if sound reached my ears. She had a pretty good idea that it had. She was asking, why aren't you doing what I told you to do? That only happened once. (laughs) Hearing doesn't mean that the sound just reached God's ears. It means that God is going to respond to the agony of his people. Hearing in the Bible usually means to be aware of something and to respond. And if you didn't respond, even if the sound reached your ears, it was understood, it was talked about as if you didn't hear. Second thing that God does is he remembered his covenant. This is not saying that God's promises had slipped his mind, but fortunately the reminder on his phone went off. God is not sitting there saying, oh yeah, I need to pick up some milk, some honey, and oh, some promises, I need to not forget those. This is a way of saying that God is about to act on his promises. This signals that there is a turning point. God has said enough to the oppression of his people. Third thing that God does is he saw the people of Israel. Again, it's not like God's been distracted because he was checking on how things were going in Antarctica for a few centuries. It means that God's compassion for Israel was stirred and he was going to act because of that compassion. It is the exact same terminology that is used when Moses saw his people's burden. It is a deep emotion that gets turned into action. And finally, it says that God knew. This is the same word that's used in verse 4. When Moses' sister stood at a distance to know what would happen to Moses. This is not a detached knowledge. It is not a detached learning. This is a concerned observation. God has been aware. He is aware. He continues to be aware of what is happening. And it matters to him. Lord of the Rings fans here? Good. Yeah, you're 
probably not a Christian if you're not. Um, <clears throat> Do you remember this scene in the movie? This is the siege of Minas Tirith in The Return of the King. This is a gigantic, innumerable bad guy's army that is surrounding one of the most important strongholds for the good guys. And even when good guy re reinforcements show up, the good guys are completely outnumbered and overmatched. They do not have a chance. And in the midst of this scene, the battle that's going on, all of a sudden the movie changes scenes. And it goes right here. The movie cuts to a scene in a completely different location. It's a ship that's docking. And three of the main characters somewhat gracefully jump off the ship. Aragorn, Gimli, and Legolas. And you're thinking to yourself when it cuts to this, what in the world is going on here? What does this ship docking have anything to do with this battle that I've been watching? And then it becomes clear. When a whole new kind of army of reinforcements join the good guys. And you realize the bad guys who are surrounding the city have no idea what's about to hit them. And you lean forward in your seat anticipating what is about to happen. The good guys are going to win. And that is exactly What's going on in verses 23 through 25. The passage radically changes scenes. It takes us out of Midian and into heaven and shows us what is going on there. And the whole point of the change of scenes is so we would lean forward in our chairs and prepare for something amazing. God is faithful to his promises and he is about to act. Egypt has no idea what is coming. God was faithfully at work all along. That is why he protected Moses as a baby. That is why he had Moses spend most of the first 40 years of his life in Pharaoh's palace. That is why God had Moses spend the next 40 years in the desert. Because at just the right time and in just the right way, God is going to reveal his faithfulness to his people through Moses. When this was originally written, that first audience Moses' first audience, is he's the one who wrote this, would have arrived where we ended today in this passage, and they would have been sitting on the edge of their seats. Faith, faithless Egypt, filled with extraordinary evil, doesn't know what is coming. And that original audience would have leaned forward, anticipating God's faithfulness. And that, I believe, is how we're supposed to respond to this passage. Our God is always, always at work in the details of our lives that to us can seem just like coincidence. He is always at work to mature us, to grow us, to make us more like Jesus, even in the desert times. He is always faithful, even in a world that has turned its back on God and is filled with outrageous evil. The point that Moses wanted his original readers to get from Exodus 2, the point of this sermon, is that we must anticipate God's faithfulness in a faithless world. This is not a passage that asks God, God's people to do anything. It wants God's people to see God in a certain way. Even in the face of catastrophic evil, we can anticipate that God is faithful. So how do we do that? One of the challenges that we have, I think, is to view our daily lives as a series of disconnected coincidences. Let's look for the orchestrated work of our God behind them. Let's trust his purpose in the desert seasons of life. See, we don't know how God will show his faithfulness. We don't know when we will experience his faithfulness. But we know that we will. 
for certain, we will experience the faithfulness of God. I'd like to suggest four ways that we can respond to this passage. First, continue in the reading. If you've not picked up one of the reading guides for the Pentateuch, you can grab one on the way out. It doesn't matter if you're just starting now. If you're behind, start in Exodus 24. That's where we're picking up, and, and we will read through Leviticus 10 this next week. Pray, ask the Lord to help you anticipate his faithfulness. Ask the Lord when you are in the day-to-day struggles of life, when you're trying to put together a house that has been ripped apart by a storm, when you're trying to put together a family that has been ripped apart by disease, when you're trying to put together a friendship that has been ripped apart by betrayal, what do you anticipate in that moment? Do you anticipate more evil, more destruction, or do you anticipate, do you look forward to, do you count on the fact that God is at work and he will be faithful? Participate in the 21.5 projects and pick up one of the faith paths on your way out in the foyer to my left. Let's begin the work. Let's continue the work. Let's press on in the work of transmitting our faith to the next generation. We need to close in prayer. After a message like this, why do we need to close in prayer? Why do we need to go before the Lord? Because it is not in our power to just flip a switch and say, well, I'm now going to trust that the Lord is faithful. That is a work that the Holy Spirit does within us. And so we go to him And we say, help us with that. Help us deepen our understanding and our faith, our anticipation of God's faithfulness in our life. I'm going to invite the prayer team to come forward. As they come forward, will you stand with me? We'll close in prayer. This prayer team is here to pray with you no matter what you are struggling with. If you're dealing with the aftermath of storms, if you're dealing with the aftermath of completely different types of storms in your life, or if you just want to know more about who this God is who is faithful, please come forward and allow us to pray with you at the end. No one's going to be watching you. We just want to spend some time praying with you. Join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, you are so faithful. We live in a faithless world. We live in a world that is characterized by evil and injustice, but you are faithful. Lord, we have so many people here this morning facing so many challenges, some of them the physical challenges caused by storms. Lord, we had five families up here this morning dedicating their children who are facing the extraordinary challenges of a new phase of life. Lord, we have graduates who are facing the challenges that are ahead of them. But Lord, every one of us is facing something. And we will either shrink in fear. We will either wonder where you are. Or we will anticipate your faithfulness. Knowing that you are good and that you are with us. Lord, help us to be a body of believers. Help us to be families and individuals who anticipate your faithfulness. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me leave you with this thought. It's very simple. Your God is a faithful God. And he is at work in the details of your life. Leave here and pay attention to his faithfulness in every detail of your day. You are dismissed.